Hello guys, Winston here. If you pay any attention to tech news, you'll probably know that Apple recently unveiled the design of their newest high-performance computer, the late 2019 Mac Pro. It's a welcome return of Apple's classic tower architecture after a few short but painful years of living in the era of the thermally limited trash can Mac. And while all the tech reviewers are itching to get their hands on the new hardware this fall to test the latest and greatest in Apple-flavored CPUs and GPUs, no one's asking the really important performance question, how well does the Mac Pro work as a cheese grater? And that's something we don't have to wait for the fall to find out, because the Mac Pro grill's texture is something that's really quite straightforward to reverse engineer. Its unique three-dimensional vents are machined on both internal and external surfaces. When I first saw that design during the keynote and the mention of the double-sided machining required to produce it, I thought, that's remarkably easy. It's a pattern of hemispherical cutouts that's repeated and offset from behind just like a crystalline structure. So I decided to take a crack at it, though only a small subset of that pattern since I'm kind of tired of large, time-consuming aluminum projects on my Shapeoko. I'm sure you'll understand why. The basic gist of my idea was to model a set of round cuts into a solid volume that would fit comfortably in one hand, and then make the offset cuts from below. However, because those bottom cuts wouldn't be centered, I had to rebuild the walls of my mini Mac Pro grill that had been blown open by my revolved cuts. Apple takes a shortcut here and doesn't fully open up their 3D texture around the border of their Mac Pro, so I could have gotten away with only making the fully hemispherical cuts, but when I asked myself what Steve Jobs would do, it was clear that I couldn't compromise on the ventilation of my cheese grater. So in that sense, I'm actually improving Apple's design by taking the time to make all these small cutouts around the perimeter. Next, I started making toolpaths, and here things got a little trickier, because all my toolpaths wanted to dip down into the cutouts to the opposite side, which slowed things down and added time. I tried to limit this by raising my cutting depth and using different constraint options or patches, but nothing really worked, so I figured I would just eat the time difference here. The machining process would go something like this. Surface the top of my part, then use adaptive clearing to rough out the holes, first with a quarter inch end mill for speed, and then switching to an eighth inch end mill to get closer to the floor. Next, I would use a ball end mill to smooth out those beautiful concavities, my toolpath of choice, the scallop for its evenly spaced stepovers. Then a chamfer operation to lightly break all my edges and really make Johnny Ive proud, and finally I'd flip the part over and repeat everything I'd done before. Seemed straightforward enough. I rolled through the first set of toolpads for the front side and then used a vise to hold my part for the reverse side operations. Here I'm using the Carbide 3D Touch Probe's status LED and exploiting the property of electrical continuity to manually find the center point of my cheese grater prototype. However, when I finished running the toolpads for the other side, I discovered a problem. My cutouts weren't intersecting correctly, and after a bit of thinking, I realized why. From the top, my cutouts are symmetrical, so whether or not I cut them this way or this way, these holes will be in the same spot. However, my toolpads themselves were not orientation agnostic. Because they go through the holes into the other side, that forces the cutouts on the other side to have to be made in the correct positions, and that didn't happen here. I rotated my piece the wrong way, about Y instead of about X, so the cutouts on the reverse side were centered at the wrong nodes in my pattern. With that knowledge and having sat through toolpads that took longer than necessary, I took a new approach to machining the second prototype. I would split my model into two variants, one with the top cutouts only, and one with the bottom cutouts only. By doing it this way, my toolpads follow simple, circular paths that are smoother and more continuous, and it won't matter how I flip my part. I also picked up a few tricks to improve the surface finish of the sections on the back side. The original scallop toolpath that I used was fairly aggressive with regards to wall contact, so things got a little chattery at times. My new toolpads used a 3D contour with a conservative step down for the steep sections and then blended into a scallop toolpath for everything shallower than 60 degrees. Machining of the second cheese grater prototype went a lot better. After removing my part from the vise, I used a small rounded file to remove any burrs inside the cutouts. Now to properly make this look like it was cut out of a Mac Pro, we need to put a satin finish on it via abrasive blasting. Here I'm using a Harbor Freight air eraser to evenly frost the surface. 
And then to lock in that texture, which right now is extremely easy to scratch, I need to anodize it. And for that, I'm borrowing JPL Richards DIY anodizing setup. Now, I'm still learning and understanding all the variables that affect the success rate of DIY anodizing, so I'll talk about that process down the road. For now, all you need to know is that I did a plain anodize without color on the Mini Mac Pro grill. That makes this surface food safe, but that's kind of a secondary benefit in my opinion. The most important thing is that this thing is scratch resistant. And now to answer the question that's on everyone's mind but really doesn't matter, is this thing actually the cheese grater people make it out to be? I already know that soft cheeses won't work. The edges simply aren't sharp enough to slice through it. I would end up extruding it through these holes like a pasta dye. But a harder cheese, like Pecorino Romano? That might actually shear off well enough to make this work. I'll first isolate a chunk of this wedge to work with, then slice off the tip to sample. Hmm, firm, dry, little nutty and salty, perfect. On a hunch, I'll slice off a little stick of cheese and save that for later. Let's get to the main event with what I have here. And, well, I mean, it, it kinda works. It's shearing off large flakes of cheese, but you really need to apply pressure to make it work. But what if we try grating our cheese a little differently? What if we take that stick of cheese that we set aside earlier and turn that in one of the cutouts of the grill? Sadly, the effectiveness of this method quickly drops to zero once your stick of cheese gets shaved down to a ball. That densely packed pill of pecorino, though, is extra delicious. So, in conclusion, the performance of the Mac Pro as a cheese grater is unsurprisingly disappointing. Despite the prodigiously perforated surface area present on the grill pattern, it really doesn't do a good job of shaving material from flat surfaces. And that gives me an idea for an alternate use for the Mac Pro grill, a soap dish. So there you have it. Though Apple might not make a very good cheese grater, their potential to expand their product lines into Bed Bath & Beyond shouldn't be discounted. Thank you all very much for watching, and I'll be back soon with more CNC projects and DIY nonsense.